I thought I heard them, thought I heard them coming. All right, back to, Strat, to Shakespeare in Stratford. Um, he went to the Stratford Grammar School, which probably got him the equivalent of an education today that would get you, say, through maybe middle of junior high. He learned reading, writing, arithmetic, some of the basics there, but not a well-educated guy and not well-traveled. He gets married, settles into some sort of life there in Stratford-upon-Avon. The next thing we hear from him is, uh, in terms of the physical record of things that are written down about him, is around 1585. That's um, three years later, he has twins, and his twins were named Hamnet. Hmm. Hamnet. Sounds like Hamlet. Hamnet and Judith. They were born around 1582. Hamnet, his only son, dies at the age of 11 in 1596. Now, we don't know much about this story. The next thing we see about William Shakespeare is that by 1584, just a little before Hamnet and Judith were born, he has shown up in London as gained some reputation in London as a playwright and an actor. So 1584, he begins to show up. And then suddenly there's all of these plays written by William Shakespeare that are being performed around London. And then we have this historical record of him. Why is this a problem? Why do people have a little bit of a conspiracy theory about this? It's because uh, they wonder how someone who f came from such humble origins could possibly have written such amazing plays that evoke such a sense of place of things like Hamlet being set in Denmark, it feels sort of Danish, or Romeo and Juliet in Venice. Uh, other places that he's never visited. Well, as far as we know, he never visited Scotland either, and this is what Macbeth is set in, Scotland, back in the 11th century. Why did Shakespeare, why was he able to write these things? Because he read a lot of books. We'll come back to that as we talk about, more specifically about Macbeth and about uh, Romeo and Juliet, where he got some of the source material for this. So by 1584, he had become known as a playwright in London, and that's Mm, uh, 16 years before the turn of the century. By the turn of the century, he was not only a famous playwright, he was one of the most famous playwrights in England and was very wealthy, wealthy enough that he was able to leave London, go back to Stratford-upon-Avon, and buy the biggest house in the city and live there in his retirement. And he wrote a little bit in his retirement, but most of his work was done uh, before, about 16, before about 1606. Right, So most of his work was done by, before that. Um, most of his plays are also inspired by real events. Macbeth is about a real Scottish king who lived in Scotland in uh, the 11th century, around 1000 AD. He really was a Scottish king who murdered the king before him, Duncan, and then was killed himself. Romeo and Juliet is about a pair of two real, uh, real lovers in Venice who actually lived, and there's other attributions before Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet. Uh, that attribute the existence of these two. They lived around 1303 and then both died from something similar to what Shakespeare writes in the play Romeo and Juliet. They're based on the reality. So he must have read a lot to be able to write these things. Uh, so that's a little bit about the history of Shakespeare. He writes most of his plays uh, around the, six, the beginning of the 17th century, 1600s, and they are fantastic plays, but they're plays. We've got to talk about that just a little bit. When you sit down to read Macbeth, you probably hopefully have already read some of it, you'll realize that it's just not a great read. It's just, it's kind of hard to read. It's blocky, it's chunky, it's in funny language. Uh, the reason for that was it wasn't meant to be read. When William Shakespeare wrote it, it was meant to be heard. A play is meant to be heard, and it's different. The author uses a different style than someone who's writing a play. Uh, writing a book. You write a book, it's written to be read. And a good book, well, you will read it like Canterbury Tales, and you read the words and you understand what the author is saying. But in a play, the author is a further, two further steps removed from his audience. First, he has to write the words such that someone else can say them, the actors, and they're almost all written in terms of dialogue. There's no descriptions in a play, or very few. Everything has to be the actors and the, uh, and the actresses, well, in Shakespeare's day, it was only actors, but the characters on the stage are the ones who have to describe what's going on. So, in a way, uh, it's a more difficult literary style than just writing a book. If you're writing a book, you can write down anything you want to. Fred walked down the street and was attacked by a bear. But in a play, you have to describe that action through the characters, or you have to you know, write in the margin, Fred walked down the street, he's attacked by a bear, and then the actors have to act it out. So the author of a 
play doesn't put any more near as much detail into the scenes or into the, the action. He leaves that in the hands of the actors. He puts all of his work, the author of a play, puts all of his work into the dialogue. What people say to each other and what people say aloud to themselves. When people speak aloud to themselves, it's called a soliloquy. And in a sense, that's what I'm doing now, except I'm talking to a computer, being recorded. It's going to come see you. Eventually, you'll hear it, I hope. But I'm making a soliloquy. I'm speaking aloud to myself. Shakespeare was a master of a soliloquy. Oftentimes, the best parts of his plays are when one of the characters wanders off to the edge of the stage and stands by himself or herself, himself, because it was an actor playing a girl, even if it was a girl, a male actor, and would stand there and talk about what was going on in their heart or their soul. The most famous is obviously Hamlet's soliloquy to be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, blah, blah, blah. I won't do it, go into that because we're not studying Hamlet. But Hamlet's not talking to any other characters in this soliloquy. He's talking to the audience. And in a way, he's really just talking to himself. Shakespeare's a master of this. And you really get to see into the characters into what's going on inside of them in these soliloquies, and he does it well, and they feel natural. So, as I was saying a minute ago, this isn't something that's a great read. In fact, I strongly suggest that when you read Shakespeare, you sit with the book open. Here's Macbeth. Oh, it's backwards. Is that better? You sit with the book open, and you actually listen to it on tape, or listen to it, or watch a video of it, and follow the language as... The, uh, as it goes along through the play, and you listen to it, then it's more powerful. But even then, it's a step removed from the real thing. And the real thing is when you see it live in person. And you don't even have to know the plays or the lines, but when you see it live in person and you see what the characters are doing and see the inter interaction, it, that's when the power of it comes across. So, 400 years after he wrote those things, we're still studying Shakespeare, and everybody goes, oh, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. Is why is it that we study Shakespeare? There were other playwrights, including Ben Jonson and Philip Marlowe and many others, that wrote at the same time that, Philip, that Shakespeare wrote these. Why is it that we have this giant book, The Complete Works of Shakespeare, big old heavy thing, and we study these things still, and people are so fascinated by this guy, when Marlowe and Jonson and some of the other people, they just don't get as much attention. Why is that? He's good. He was that good. In fact, if you read a Marlowe play, or a Philip Johnson, or a Ben Johnson play, you go, hey, that's a pretty good play. Yeah, that was not bad. And you might even see it and enjoy it. You go, that was pretty good. But, but there's other plays of Shakespeare's. When you read them and you watch them, you just go, oh my gosh, that was like nothing I've ever seen. It's astounding. And 400 years later, people are still pointing to, him, to William Shakespeare. Don't take my word for it. Read other people besides me. I mean, I'm just telling you what other people have told me, right? Other people are saying, this guy is the best wizard of the English language ever. 400 years, we haven't, be we haven't bettered him, uh, which is kind of amazing. And that's one of the reasons we still study him. 400 years ago, William Shakespeare wrote these plays. And some of the things he said are still in common usage today. Some of his turns of phrase. We'll look at more of those as we look through the plays, Macbeth and... Uh, Romeo and Juliet, but some of the things that he said are things that everybody recognizes, like out, out, damn spot, or Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo, things like that, that everybody knows, and they know there's Shakespeare, because his plays are so influential in the English language, and as I said, except for the King James Bible, there's nothing that's as influential as William Shakespeare's works on English. Let's take a step back in just a second and look at that. Hold on, let me pause this and start over.